Welcome everyone back. I'm not a believer that because the schedule says an hour and a half, we're going to be here for an hour and a half. But uh, let me introduce a special guest, Senator Jeff Brandis, who's sitting to Michelle's right. Uh, he has been of invaluable help in the steering committee and the planning for this event and the input, but also held a, a summit of his own recently, uh, not too long ago, if I recall. And what I'd like to do without, you can read about Senator Brandis, he, he doesn't need the introduction. Uh, I would love to hear Senator Brandis talk about that event first and, sure. and what came from that. Yeah, let me, let me tell you a little bit about how I got involved in criminal justice because I'm, I'm not an attorney by trade, I'm a Christian. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, let's goodness. start over. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's a by, by, by the way, who invited him? <laughs> okay. Uh, I love it. And, and also, could you could you also talk about you know your legislative initiatives as well? So sure. yes, Happy go to, right ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, I I was asked to serve on criminal justice committee about four years ago now. I guess it was about four years ago now, um, and I had no legal background. Had been a military officer for eleven years. Spent two thousand three, two thousand four in Iraq with the hundred first, and uh, and got assigned to this committee and thought this would be a new interesting adventure sat down there this was when our uh recently departed senator chairman greg evers was was on the committee and chaired the committee and uh heard the story uh this is you know early on in session of a gentleman who had acted out in prison in south florida and they had put him in the shower they had turned the shower all the way up and they left him in there for two days for, for about two hours and they, they cooked him and I was in shock and I'm looking around the table and I see my fellow senators, there's a very small committee, there was just five of us and somebody was on their phone and somebody was kind of looking up in the air and I had this panic moment that I felt like I was on a plane at 30,000 feet with an engine out flying upside down and nobody at the controls. And I recognized over the next course of that entire session that there was no real vision for where criminal justice should go in this state. And I'm somebody who believes that, that the legislature needs two things to be successful at anything. It needs, it needs a vision and it needs a champion. And criminal justice reform for frankly for, for far too long in this state has had no vision and clearly no champion. And this is one of those issues that if you go back to my hardworking taxpayers that I re represent and you ask them where, where, where on the list of priorities does things fall? Jobs, insurance, education, top 100. This is like 106. They are not, they, they just don't care. This is, they, they just want people to go away. And what's happened in our system over the last few years is because there's been no overall vision and there's definitely been no overall champion, we have allowed this to, to, to wander with really rudderless in policy world. And so the sheriffs have pulled a little bit of the policy here and hey, let's enhance mandatory minimums. And the prosecutors have enhanced here, and let's let's do a little bit more here. Um, and we've cobbled together a sentencing scheme that doesn't work, a prison system that's radically underfunded. We've uh, a transition program that's anemic at best, and rural and, and rural communities that have no place to divert to. So they divert to prison because there is no there's nothing off there, there's no off ramp off the highway to prison system. Um, and so the, what we're working to do is establish a conversation about what the future holds and how do we cast a bold vision for the future for what Florida's criminal justice system should really look like. Because I will tell you, we have 96,000 people incarcerated in Florida's prison system today, and we can only afford about 86,000 of them. If you go down today to Hardy Correctional, you will see 1,500 inmates, you will see one teacher in the entire prison. Um, this last year, we cut our chaplains' hours in half. I said we ch cut our chaplains in half one time too, and they, and they believe that. Oh but <laughs> um, but it, it, at the end of the day, we have to cast a bold new vision for where we want to go in the criminal justice system, and that's going to require the bar to get engaged, and not just to get engaged in a one-year, one-time event. It, it, did anybody know the name John Kirtley? Does anybody know the name John Kirtley? If I read anybody, somebody, some, a few of you know John Kirtley. 
John Clearly is kind of a legend in the school choice movement. Year after year, one issue he takes on. Wealthy individual lives here in South Tampa, probably five, probably five miles from his house. Um, one issue, school choice. I support candidates, Republicans or Democrats, that support school choice. Arguably has done more for the state of Florida in school choice than any other person, any definitely any legislator, because consistently, year after year after year, he focuses on school choice. We need a John Curtley of the criminal justice system. We need one person that will step up and year after year financially support, educate legislators, advocate, and consistently push. And we need the bar to step up and consistently push. And those two things together, as well as Angel investing in a handful of legislators, are where we need this future of this industry, this, this group to go. Um, because barring that, we will create a vacuum again of leadership and we will lose track of a vision and we will lose track of champions. So the first thing we need to do is create a vision. I think beginning today is where we, you know, in this conference is really where, where that vision starts. I think it's got to be championed by people like at the, the bar that bring it some, some third party validation. Because legislators get in there and we just, we, you know, we're, we're, none of us are experts at really all that much. We're expected to be. You know, once you become a senator, you're supposed to be anointed in, in, in all things transportation, education, criminal justice, health care. But that's not the truth. The truth is we, we, we have very little knowledge in many of the deep areas that we that go into when we rely on you to help us. So we need your help to cast a vision. And I think we need to start with some of the areas like transitions that are that are easier, that we have some basis to start with. And we need to talk about diversion but we really need to get into in, in the deep dives into sentencing and look at sentencing reform. And that's gonna take us years to do, and that's gonna take a lot of your leadership and dedication and frankly treasure to hire groups to help us think through what sentencing should really look like in Florida. Because we have screwed it up. You have heard, maybe you heard Len talk about yesterday, Len Engel from the Crime Justice Institute says, Jeff, I've, I've been across this country. I have seen all kinds of sentencing schemes. I have never seen anything as complicated as Florida's sentencing structure, right? And when you start hearing that from somebody who has literally seen it all, as far as uh, other states uh, go, that tells you the deep-rooted problems that we're going to get into. We're not going to untangle the string. And this is, you know, uh, just, it's going to take a while. But we have to understand the vision for where we're going to. We have to find champions to take us there. So thanks. And Tell us about the event you held. So uh, sure, the event I helped. So really, it was a it was really a, a smaller symposium of this. Len spoke, uh, Greg Newgren spoke. We were really looking at at trying to help uh, people understand the the global problem, and then begin to talk through some of the specific solutions. Obviously, Greg is probably one of the best people. Greg Newbern from Families Against Mandatory Minimum, probably one of the best person in the country to talk about mandatory minimum reform um, and the challenges and the and the hardships that that places on families. So, so Greg spoke pretty passionately about some of the issues he's seen um, and, and continues to work through. Um, and then we really focus on diversion. I'm somebody who believes you have to divert people from from the on ramp uh, from the highway of the to the prison system, and, and that focuses on mental health diversion, op you know, drug addiction diversion, veterans diversion. You know, give me a reason to divert, and we will divert. Um, but that requires the legislature to provide the funds to communities. Could we recognize in rural communities, unless you provide 100% of funding, like 80% of funding with a 20% match, and they can't come both with 20%, doesn't matter. You've got to provide them. 100% of, of, of the ability to fund diversion programs. Um, because if you look at what happens in the, in, in the state, the, rural, the, the urban communities largely have a few diversion programs. The rural communities have none. And so how do we, we, we have to be very targeted um, with our funds to make sure that we're giving rural communities all the resources that they need to, to divert to it as well. Um, but that was really our conference was really focused in on kind of those three things, um, mandatory minimums, trying to understand the global picture. And then there's this kind of question that I keep coming back to, which is divert to what? And and how do we think about that, that the solution to the divert to what question? What is What are the next steps with the folks that you brought together with your summit and what were your plans? 
what was your vision with that? Yeah, so my, my vision was really to get my community to begin to understand why I care about this issue. And what and 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 that an absence of one or two legislators picking up the mantle on this and carrying it forward, that it, we will continue to kind of meander for the next decade. Now, in terms of the the legislation that you were trying to promote or you've been promoting, um, that ended up what can you give us sort of the the journey of what happened in the the last legislative session with some of the common sense criminal justice reform you were trying to push forward? Yeah, so we really thought we would kind of you know like spaghetti throw it against the wall and see what stuck um, to figure out where where we could go and and the, the the challenge you have as a legislator in dealing with this issue is is it's kind of like you coming up as a firefighter to a house with every room is on fire and trying to figure out which one to start with um, because diversion isn't working juvenile justice was was probably our best system um but in the adult system we had problems in the prisons we have problems hiring we have problems um in in transitions uh we had problems with recidivism and so where where do we begin to build that foundation um and and, and what's the legislative appetite for some of these issues uh, so we focused on safety valve creating a safety valve for nonviolent mandatory minimums. We thought that was really important to begin that conversation. Um, simple things like raising the felony threshold, which hasn't been raised since the mid eighties and is th at $300, one of the lowest in the country. Uh, and, and then working on uh, one of the more challenging problems specifically for Florida is this aging elderly population where we spend two thirds of our funds for healthcare on, on, on our elderly inmates. And so we're, how do we begin to think through some of these complicated problems um, as, as it relates to, to just those three or four areas? There was a lot of other things in the, in the legislation. Ultimately, what ended up passing was uh, was the um, kind of a measures for justice, transparency and accountability piece, as well as some civil citation reform. Uh, but it was by no means what we think we can pass, what we should pass. Uh, and, and what we really need to continue to focus in on is, is building that bold vision. Senator Brandis, let me ask a question. You mentioned when you began about not wanting something to just last for a year, have a summit, and then go off into the sunset, and then somebody thinks of the idea of having another one. I had the privilege of serving on the Supreme Court Innocence Commission. I don't know if Brad King's still here. He was on it, too. And it produced a number of serious recommendations. The only one that was adopted in the state of Florida was the bar and the Supreme Court mandated two hours of CLE on discovery and Brady production. That's all it can. But it did have recommendations about the recordation of interviews of suspects. It did have recommendations about eyewitness identification. It did have recommendations about preservation of evidence in scientific laboratories. But none of them ever changed. Didn't change anything. How do you keep the flame alive that this isn't just a waste of all of our time to sit around, great discussions, mm -hmm. and then a year or two years later, everything's the same? How do you, how do you keep it alive? Well, I think a couple of things are different now. Um, one thing is that the substantial thing that's different is that they're out of money. There is, there isn't money to be had. We're, we're going to have to rebuild two or three of these prisons now. I mean, golf is gone. Golf prison is, you know, they're going to, it's going to have to be completely rebuilt. Um, a couple of the other prisons in the state of Florida are going to have to be completely or, or substantially rebuilt or, or millions and millions of dollars of repairs are going to have to be made. Um, and so when you're dealing with a slice of a budget that I have and they say, well, that's still all got to come out of your slice. What happened this year was we had a, uh, a federal lawsuit for $40 million to treat hepatitis C, a federal lawsuit for ADA compliance of six to $10 million, uh, and a federal lawsuit for mental health of $40 million that all had to be funded out of the same slice. And, and by the way, I got $70 million less of a slice than, than I, than I are arguably needed. Um, and that I told them I needed. Um, and so there th th this year, um, after speaking to my, you know, Tim Sadbury, who's my staff director, we think that number is probably $200 million to stay just level, not, not add programming, not, not get back to the 40% cuts that we took away this year to get back to par. Um, and so they, you know, one of my favorite sayings in politics is Ben Stein's dad. His name was Herb Stein. He was Nixon's Council of Economic Advisors. He said he, he came up with this thing called Stein's Law, which is things that are unsustainable tend to stop. <laughs> right? Trends that can't continue won't. And in, in, this, in the world of criminal justice, 
we cannot continue to move into the warehousing world where we fund less and less um, of the criminal justice space every year. The system is currently 2,000 guards short for staffing. I mean, if you think your business has a tough time finding employees at 3.7% unemployment rate, good luck finding good prison guards. Because if you're an A or a B student in Gulf County, you're not going to be a prison guard. You're going to go someplace else. And so what are we left with? Well, we're left with 2,000 vacancies, and the people that we're hiring, we're really struggling. And you can see this in some of the, 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 the uh, you know, we have a board that takes away badges for officers. The number one position that they take away is prison guards. Uh, they're bad. They pull their badge. Um, and because they're subsidizing their income by smuggling and drugs and everything else. Um, so, yeah. They're, they're out of money. Is, is it unfair to ask you a question in public? Is there going to be any appetite to increase taxes in Florida to pay for you, any of this stuff? Because you, education, yeah. health, prisons, criminal justice is always lived at the bottom of the system yeah the answer is no all right then the next question is where does the money come? well the you, you the, take it from education you know, uh, uh, the, the company but the, in the short term in the short term you you have to focus on policy recommendations that reduce reduce some of the pressure on the prison system look we, we have two choices here this is like a this is like a, a pot that's about to boil all over right we can we can put a brick on it and we can sit on it and let it blow us apart well, we can let some of the steam out. And that means we've got to focus on diversion and focus on transitions and focus on looking at the 85% raw and looking at and, and, and negotiating what that actually means. I mean, if you ask the, if you ask the governor what 85% means, he'll tell you that means 85% prime bars. If you ask the, the legislature, uh, or so if you ask the, the um, Department of Corrections what it means, they'll tell you, well, it's 85% of your time sleeping on a government pillow. And it's and if you ask the legislature what it may mean, you'll have some that says, well, it means 85% under supervision. Well, all those are three different answers for the same question. Um, and so I think we actually need to define what 85% really means. And I think it could mean 85% of your time under supervision. Well, is electronically monitored being supervised? Absolutely it is. And it takes you, you know, you talk to my sheriff, he's saying, look, I, I spent $120 a night keeping somebody locked up. I spend seven dollars keeping them under electronic on electronic monitoring. So we have to use technology. We have to we have to redefine some of these questions. But we ultimately have to take pressure off the system because there is no way. I don't care how much you raise taxes that they're ever going to allocate more money to the prison system. And you have to fix the policy behind it first. You have to get down from ninety six thousand inmates. You have to get down to something like eighty six thousand, and then you have to focus on diversion and transition to keep people out. And you also have to uh, properly fund the judiciary uh, because the judiciary is not funded. They are underfunded and we all expect them to do their job and to have the technology that they need to make the decisions that they need to make to keep the community safe, to do an appropriate job, to make sure that justice is served and they can't with uh, the money that they're given. And so the it's that's a constant battle as well. And um, yeah. we have we have just so that you know the folks that are that are here today and that have been participating are elected state attorneys, elected public defenders, chief judges, um, judges in circuit and county. We've had appellate judges. We have practitioners. Uh, we have folks in, from think tanks on both sides and and everyone else in between trying to all come together. And obviously, money is is the name of the game as well. And so absolutely. But I think, but I, but I think to your point, um, what I hear from judges is, look, I don't need more money. I, I mean, they'll tell you quietly they'd love more money, but um, what they want is more money for their staff. Look, I don't uh, don't pay me pay my staff. Well, it's, something and to and, keep them. and and you also, you know, as I said, we have elected state attorneys and public defenders who, you know, lose so many lawyers. There's so much turnover in their office because lawyers cannot afford to be in their offices, and so they're losing institutional knowledge, and they're having baby lawyers, you know, handling mm -hmm. all these types of cases. Again, they're underfunded as well. So, you know, but the the challenge that I have is they're all funded out of the same slice of pie. Tiny slice of pie. Well, it's the same <laughs> tiny slice of pie that has $40 million of federal lawsuits for hepatitis C and $40 million of lawsuits for mental health. And those got to be paid first. 
Senator, can I ask, I want to follow up on something you said, and then I hope you take questions from sure. the crowd. 85% minimum mandatories, life sentences, no parole, all, all this stuff. Is there a focused effort in the legislature to say, let's solve these problems, let's revisit what we've created? We don't have money, so let's change what's filled 96,000 beds. Is there, is there a, a focused effort? Is somebody taking the lead to say, let's revisit whether 85% should apply to everybody. Let's revisit whether all these crimes should have minimal mandatories. Is, is there an effort to do that? There's, there's, it started as an effort of one. Okay. And uh, we've, we're starting, sorry, thank you. And thank you. But, but we're starting to build a coalition. I mean, you, we are starting to build, people are beginning to get why wow, this matters. And part of it is most of these legislators have never toured a prison, never. Most have probably never met with their chief justice. They, they've never met with, some of them have never met with their, their, their local state's attorneys. Um, and so how do we educate them and how do we help them understand the vision and the problem statement? Because it's just too easy to ignore. And again, their constituency ask, isn't asking them for to address this issue. Right. Judge Davis? So back to the champion Mm -hmm. which is about focusing attention mm -hmm. how much will that cost how much will a champion cost what does a champion need how much money does a champion need to focus the attention the way you think it needs to be focused uh, how much does like, so let's let's you need a legislative champion but you need you need and the, it isn't as far as money. It isn't. There isn't money. There's a vision. We need. You, you have to have a vision before you get the champion, right? Yeah. Or you know, you have to. You have to. We have to work together to cast the vision, and we have to understand what what that vision means and and, and what that ultimately gets us. I think you know that's that's where we need to start. That's where we need the bar to start. That's where we need, and, and that we can do that. Right. Was that gentleman who focused John Curley, yeah. brought money to mm -hmm. bear on that process. How much is needed, do you think, for the attention of our legislature to be focused on the need for reform? Oh, you need a high net worth individual that can make this a project. Right? And, I, and how much is that? Well, look, I mean, I, I would imagine Curley probably spends a million dollars a year. How many? A million. On legislation, but but look, but, we have we have billionaires in this state that care about all kinds of things. I just need one to care about criminal justice reform. And everybody once we now everybody knows that, right? <laughs> Anybody right. here a billionaire? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I 100% agree with you. But what you just said is, you, you know, we don't need a lobbyist. We need them to under. What you said is, you need a campaign. We need a campaign to understand so that when people go back home, they aren't soft on crime, that they're smart on crime. Smart on crime. Right? We need a campaign to support those individuals when they go back home so that they know that, you know what, if you, even if you take this tough vote, we're going to be with you. Right? It is, that's the kind of stuff you need. It is, it, because it's easy for them to vote no. Let, let, voting no in the legislature is the easiest thing you can do, right? It's, 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 how do I support them to vote yes? And how do I educate them on why to vote yes? And how do I get the leadership of the legislature to pay attention, right? It's not just the individual champion. I could spend that, you know, if I was a, a if I was a Florida House member, right, I could spend eight years working on this. And if I'm not rising up into leadership, and if leadership doesn't take an, inch, an interest in this, 
then they're just going to push it to the side. How do I get how do I get the leadership of the legislature to understand and make this a priority? Is That's leadership of the legislature interested in this? Because we have new lead, we have new leaders. We have a new Senate president. We have a new uh, Speaker of the House. What are yeah. their what are where where are they on criminal justice? Smart criminal justice reform. I think they're they under, they are beginning to understand the scope of the problem. I don't think that they fully understand it. I think they're beginning to understand it, and I think it's going to take years of education for just them and, and frankly, their follow-on speakers to do it, uh, and, and, and Senate presidents. I think you have some that it would, I think Galvana will be uh, amenable to some of these ideas. I think, I think next year, if you look at um, Oliva, uh, Speaker Oliva is, you know, he's basically a libertarian, and so he, I think he will be amenable to that. I don't have the same confidence that um, that unless we have a clear vision and we have good champions, that Sprouse and, and Simpson will will have the same mindset on criminal justice reform. Okay, way in, way in the back. A lot of the reforms that we talk about are post hoc. Like mandatory minimum reform is reform after the fact, after a crime is committed. What's your opinion on prescriptive reform? Um, I know you put in the budget the court messaging project. The message about the state. Mm -hmm. What other projects do you see like that in the future to keep people from entering that downward spiral? Yeah, so it's it, the, the, it comes back to the divert to what question? How do we continue and become a, a, a state that, that looks at the best practices for diversion? Um, I think, you know, I, I found that idea off a news article out of New York where basically they had taken these, they had figured out that if they just sent people a text message about their court dates, like 10 days out, two days out, the day of, that 25% more people were showing up for court and it was costing them virtually nothing. So we put $750,000 in the budget for the clerks to set up a system just to text, right? That, the, it's, it's that idea that we think we can continue to expand out, but that's a, that's a, a a process, but it's also a diversion, right? We want to divert you away from skipping a court date. Let's 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 implement some processes that, that work on that. Have all the other hands. Okay. Judge yes. Greg. So I may have misspoke. It's not 40 million one time. It's 40 million annually. Um, same with hepatitis C. That's another 40 million annually that we have to spend on Hep C. So um, for, services, for, for, for mental health services, it, it's a, that's exactly right. It's 40 million dollars in addition to what we were spending. It's 40 million dollars in addition for mental health services and hepatitis C services inside the Department of Corrections. Um, the, the, the challenge I have is it. Uh, I, I don't have the. Uh, when I get my slice of pie, right, I, I have to pay everything else out of that. And, and the diversion piece is usually, you know, I, I might have $10 million of all the programs that I want to do. I might only have $10 million. Divide 10 by 67 counties, I got nothing. It's like vapor in the bucket. It's not even a drop in the bucket, right? And so how do I get real money to focus on one issue? And that's that's the the legislator's dilemma that I run into, which is I can do I can I could say I want to divert, but if I'm spending sixty ten million dollars divided by sixty seven counties, I've got no money to spend on anything. And so we spend, we'll end up spending it in one time projects. Correct. 
Correct. It's inmates incarcerated. No. Judge Stargell, and then Kerry. And then, and then Brian. to be, be in to build momentum. I mean, this is, legislating is a momentum game. And, and so how do you establish that first down and then the next first down and then, you know, pass for, for 50 yards, right? It's, 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 you, it's, it's, that's, it's an incremental game. Yeah, Carrie and then Carrie. Brian. Um, so I want to thank President Suskauer and Tim for putting together this summit. My question really is for the Florida Bar. I will say as from the Florida Bar on criminal justice issues. And I am very interested in the Florida Bar, and I think um, President Suskauer's interest in criminal law has helped that, I know, also for Hank. But is there a feeling that the Bar, the Board of Governors, is going to get behind real criminal justice reform, or is in the legislature? Because we sort of need that voice. As public defenders, you can state attorneys, Thank you, Carrie. That I and I appreciate you being here. Carrie is my public defender. Um, we are lucky. We have Buter Emhoff here, who is our general counsel in terms of what the bar can do and can't do in terms of specific issues. Is that right, Buter? Is there any limitation that we have regarding particular issues as a bar or in general? Guidelines we have to follow from uh, the Supreme Court, and uh, each uh, individual issue uh, has, to, has to meet the supply period. The work the work right. So, but in terms of the sort of the, first of all, this would not have happened but for the support of the Board of Governors who approve this concept moving forward. So they're very, this is something that we, uh, as you know, as everyone knows here, have not focused on before, this is something that's one of my top, top priorities, and moving forward how we're going to in terms of whether we're moving into working groups or what we're doing moving forward, um, you know, we're, we're, I believe we're going to continue to have buy-in of leadership. So that's, but in terms of any specific issues, we do have to run them through our general counsel. We have to make sure, because we are a mandatory Bar. Uh, we have to make sure that we are there. There are certain criteria that we have to follow in terms of whether issues are divisive, etc. So, without getting into too much of that, but in terms of the general concepts, the board is incredibly supportive of this, and that's why we're here. I think Brian, 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 and then next. I'm probably speaking out of turn when I say this. One of the problems with diversion is the power that the state has. 
And I'll give you an example. In the statute for drug court, which is a diversionary program, if you qualify, you go. The state has no say in whether if you qualify for drug court, you go to drug court. That's not the same with diversion. You can be eligible for pretrial diversion in Florida, and the state will say the victim objects. Well, I mean, the victim wants a death penalty for a grand theft or because their car got broken into, and we understand that as defense counsel. But if you would change that part of the law to, to go along with the drug court part of it, to say that if a defendant is eligible for pretrial diversion, they get pretrial diversion. It takes the state out of it, which I know they probably don't want, uh, and it, it takes the victims out of it, and I think it should be uniform. If somebody's eligible for drug court and they can go to drug court, then if somebody's eligible for another pretrial diversion program based on their history and the crime that they are alleged to have committed, then they should be able to do that without anybody saying, well, I just don't want them to have diversion. No, those points well taken. Scott? Senator Brandis, thank you for your leadership on criminal justice reform. Um, as you, you're well aware of the, the criminal, the, the, the justice reinvestment process that a lot of other states have engaged in, which has been a kind of curated, comprehensive look at the system. And uh, many states have actually been able to accomplish criminal justice reform uh, through that process, not through the first down, first down, first down, but in fact, it, it are, in a rather, you know, Hail Mary, like, get it all done in one swoop thing. What are the prospects of that in Florida? Um, is it a prospect? Is it something that you think we should pursue? Or do you think that we're going to be stuck in this kind of piecemeal approach? I think that, I think the current federal administration is still trying to figure out what it wants to really do on criminal justice reform. Uh, the previous administration was investing pretty heavily in this kind of justice reinvestment piece, but to my knowledge, the federal government is not currently investing in justice reinvestment. And um, barring that incentive dollars to, to make it work, I, I don't think the state's going to do it. I mean, we, we, you know, we were this close. All I needed was a letter from the speaker, the, the president, and the governor and we would have had justice reinvestment taking place in Florida, a multi-year, like five years of, of um, and pretty much paid for by the federal government. And I couldn't get that. Um, not because I didn't ask, but because they wouldn't provide it. So uh, I think, you know, I'm 100% I'm sold on justice reinvestment. We just have to get to a place where everybody's comfortable with it. Senator Brandis, let me, let me ask you this. I go back to the Innocence Commission's experience. One of the members of the commission was Joe Negron. Mm -hmm. And before the commission completed its um, course, the commission had already voted to, and I think it was for the mandatory recordation of interrogations for serious crimes. Right. And Joe Negron mm -hmm. went right to the legislature with that recommendation, and he got totally undercut by law enforcement with the political power that the sheriffs and the state attorneys could bring. Mm -hmm. How do we get the buy-in on some of these issues with everybody? Forget the money. How do we get the buy-in for everybody to understand it's the right thing to do on yeah. some of these issues? I'm not saying all of them. No, no. That bill, I, I carried that bill last year. It passed the Florida Senate. It never, I don't think it ever got taken up in the Florida House. Uh, you know, the, the legislating is all about incentives, just like everything in life is largely about incentives. And so how do we, how do we incentivize leaders to take these types of issues up? And how do we take and how do we get leadership to get engaged in taking these types of issues up? Um, that's you know I, I have to believe if they had bringing that brought that bill to the the floor of the Florida House, they would have passed you know but with over a hundred votes, but uh, but it, it never it never got brought up. Um, I think that's Wait, let me interrupt you. Why is that? Why didn't it get brought up in the House? Oh, I don't know if you want me to go into this. <laughs> no, never um, mind. <laughs> listen, listen. No, you, you look. You, you have you have one or two people that are that are rising in leadership in the Florida House that have a different perspective on criminal justice reform. Period. So, so what you had spoken about before was educating folks that they may have this vision of what they think criminal justice ref justice reform is, but they haven't met their. Uh, their local judges, and they haven't been invited in and, and watched hearings, and they haven't gone and seen prisons. So, it's getting them to do that. Part of, part part of it's that. Part of it's finding who the one or two people that are holding up the entire process is, and trying to figure out how do we mitigate their concerns. 
um, because recorded interrogations makes the, absolutely the most sense in the world. Um, you know, it's what the FBI does. It's what all the major federal agencies do. It's what most states do. Um, and it's where we have a ton of problems in Florida when we don't do it. And yet we can't get the house to come along and, 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 and frankly, a lot of your sheriffs already do it. I mean, they just have a policy that they record many interrogations, but not all of them do. And so how do we, uh, how do we make sure that we have, uh, how are we making sure that we're, we're, we're mitigating their concerns? Senator, as we learned from uh, Mr. Engel yesterday, admissions to prison are way down, mm -hmm. but our population remains steady because there's basically no release mechanisms that are available. And you've alluded to uh, elderly and, and sick inmates. Are there any prospects for ever taking a second look at any of the 97,000 who are in prison right now? Uh, yeah, first we need to get the savings clause taken care of, so vote for Amendment 11. Um, that's a major a major challenge in the state is the savings clause. And so, um, you know, I've committed with Senator Roussan that if it doesn't pass this year, where every year we're in the legislature, we'll bring it up. And we'll try to get it passed again as a standalone issue until people recognize the importance of getting that out of the Constitution. I think that's one. I think to your point, we've got to we've got to divert the elderly inmates, the ones that are on, on hospice. I mean, <laughs> we let people out on hospice uh, leave, you know, three days before they pass away, and and that's just the sad truth of what we do in Florida. But then we have to look at the the individuals that we have and look at the eighty five percent rule and say, all right, can we say that electronic monitoring and a year of transition and a year of a halfway house and a year of back in your home, all um, can be considered supervision. That to me is, is a powerful tool to utilize. And that doesn't take a whole, the, 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 just, I, I'm not sure that the governor couldn't do that on his own, right, without the legislature, just as a different interpretation of law. Uh, but, but I think that's, those are some of the strategies that we have to have for transition. And that's, you know, but we've got to do that. But then we also have to fix sentencing because we still have a steady amount of people coming in the, 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 the front door. We have to continue to, to narrow that pipeline of going into the front door um, or we're never going to really solve the back end. Questions? Question. I'm just curious about how you get to 86,000 as a sustainable population, assuming that we're going to have constitutional levels of care, right? Other uh, yeah, it, it's not a sustainable, it's just affordable, right? I don't know that 86,000 is the number of what I can sustain. It's a number, it's, it's the right number to guard, right? If I have, if, if I, if I got rid of, it's what I have guards for today, right? Our current guards work a 12 hour shift, get off work, go sleep in a FEMA trailer on site for a few hours and come back on and work another 12 hour shift. And that's, that's the reality of their life. And it ain't a great life. And we wonder why they're smuggling. And we wonder why, you know, in Lowell, they're, they're getting in, in all kinds of different trouble. I mean, we have, you know, you have to cultivate and nurture your workforce. And we're not doing that. We're, you know, one of the, one of the secretary's requests this year that was we begin to hire 18 year olds to guard inmates. Right, because what, what, she's like, what else can I do? She's I, she, that's where I'm at, right? I mean, she was on the record in in my committee saying that we're literally killing our guards because they cannot keep working the pace that they're working, and they cannot keep working the hours and the way and the main in the structure that they're working. And you have to do something. And what did the legislature do? It did nothing. Right, not because I didn't want, not because I, I didn't try to do something, but because they chose to do nothing. We are on an unsustainable path. Whether we do something or don't do anything, ultimately there is going to be some stopping occurring. We have to, you know, I, I think you can you can structure it to get to eighty six thousand as a goal, um, and through diversion, through transitions, through elderly and and um, through elderly release. Uh, the, the, I think you can do all of these things, um, and then you have the resources both with guards and financially to actually move away from warehousing a population to 
uh, focusing on rehabilitation and focusing on simple things like, like literacy. I mean, if you go to our prisons today, what you'll recognize is that most of our inmates read at like the fifth or sixth grade level. They'll spend five or six years with us and leave reading at the fifth or sixth grade level because we, we aren't doing one thing right. We aren't, we aren't just focusing on literacy. Um, that's the scale of the, of the problem that I'm facing where every room is on fire. Yes, ma'am. What's my understanding of gen let's right Yeah, we, we need we need leaders to talk about it. How do I embed leaders in Lowell? How do I have people that, that are in Lowell that have relationships with elected officials that will let them know what's going on? How do I bring trusted third party outside voices to, to, to the correction system? How do I have more and more, how do I get the women of the Florida bar to establish a relationship with Lowell Correctional Facility in such a way that they are the, ad, the strongest advocates that we have. And how do we take five of those women every year and bring them up to Tallahassee every week and tell their stories to what's going on the legisl to, to, to legislators in Tallahassee? You get that done, we will change the world. Look, you, the, the best thing you could have in Tallahassee is a good story, right? Because people remember that. When, what is it gonna take for us to begin to do that? We do some. We do some other things. Like we we take kids to go see their parents at Lowell. Their kids to go see their moms at Lowell. Um, that's that's a that's a program that's run today. But how do we take the women of Lowell and get them out to Tallahassee and tell their story to legislators and and, and you to take them from room to room to room and, and share in 15, 20 minutes what their experience was like at Lowell and why legislators need to care about women in prison. Questions. No. <coughs> Senator, we can't thank you enough. I echo what Scott said. We applaud your position and commitment. Uh, we heard from Senator Bradley a great deal uh, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, and his too. So I trust you guys are working closely together. Yeah. So we do have, so we do have champions. Yeah, yeah, we do. I'm sitting next to one, and, <laughs> and I truly appreciate um, how much time that you've helped us um, you know, you and I spoke about this at least over a year ago, and you said, just tell me where it is, when it is, and what I can do to help. And um, so I truly appreciate that uh, because it really is a true partnership, and um, we need to work with the legislature to make all of these things a reality. So we truly appreciate it. And this, this has really been a start a start of the conversation that we're going to keep moving forward. And we appreciate you being part of the equation. <clears throat> Sir? Is there anybody in the room who did not provide an email address when they signed in or registered or whatever you call it? Do we have everybody's email address? So we're gonna be reaching out to everyone electronically, so look for it for next steps moving forward and evaluation. Let me ask, Ellen, could you come up here? I want to give my seat to Ellen Podgore for a minute. You may have read about her in the program. Ellen is with Stetson Law School and is the official free reporter for this event. Why don't you know? So here, take this then. Ellen and I have spoken earlier about the collection of the input of everybody here who's been here, including the people who had to leave early. Um, so she can do a final recommendation and report to the Board of Governors of the Bar, to the legislature, to the court, uh, and to other entities. But Ellen, why don't you summarize how you would like to have it done? So first of all, thank you very much, everybody here, um, and especially the three of you. I mean, it really has been just amazing to sit and listen to this. We've had two students here also, uh, Mary and John want to stand up, and we've been taking notes. <laughs> throughout this entire program, it would be very helpful, especially if the moderators could maybe 
give us a list of some of the things that came out of your session. Um, we're going to write a report. We're going to put this all together. And we're very hopeful. We're extremely hopeful that we can work with you in, in having something that you can present so that maybe some of the ideas and some of the things that may seem hopeless maybe can be more hopeful. So that's where we're at right now, is just to put together all of the materials from everything. So anything you can send me, I'm on the Stetson website, it's Ellen Podgore, um, just send it to me. It would be enormously helpful. The more we get, the better. Don't worry about overloading us. Close it down. Yeah, one yeah, second. Rick, you stand up. This is Rick Cordemash, if you haven't met him, who is the staff person with the bar who's been so valuable in assisting everything. What I talked to Ellen about, and we can take the initiative to contact the moderators, the panels, and the people on the panel and distribute Ellen's contact information. And my thoughts were, and I, don't, I haven't even talked to Michelle about it, was no later than two weeks from now, while it's fresh in people's minds, get the thoughts back to Ellen, let her compile them. The moderators of the panels can do it. You can do it independently if you wish. Uh, and so I went, I've mentioned twice the Innocence Commission. I will editorialize to say that that became a rather partisan politicized process, depending on what agenda you had when you came to that commission. I distinguish that from the experience yesterday and today, though, and what Michelle's put together. It's been a different, different experience altogether. When you had 10 elected state attorneys here at this conference who were willing to come and share their information, serve on panels, and I believe Julie and uh, Carlos gave me the names of, I think, 14 or 15 elected public defenders who've been in attendance here, not to mention all the members of the judiciary, ACLU, Southern Poverty Law Center, you name it. Uh, to all come together for a day and a half is a remarkable experience in this state. You think about what this state is, and listening to Senator Brandes, that's a remarkable thing to have happen because the agendas are as diverse as the people uh, and what people's interests are. So I applaud Michelle. Uh, I don't know if you want to open the floor or we just do it the well, way Ellen says. It yeah, no, here. I think if, if anyone did, but I, I, I want to thank Hank and Rick and the steering committee for making this a reality. But we could have planned this and had this wonderful brochure and um, the rooms and the and the cookies for Brian Tannebaum and others. Um, but nothing would have happened if you all didn't show up. So you came here, um, you left your dockets, you left your families, you left your work, uh, you left all of your other responsibilities and you came here because it mattered to you. So I applaud all of you. I thank you. I thank Senator Brandis for being our champion. We will continue to work together and with others. And you will be getting email communication from us so that we can get your valuable input, your insight, and how we can move forward. And we are moving forward. This is the beginning of the beginning of the conversation. But the fact that when I walked through the halls and I saw state attorneys and public defenders from different parts of the state chatting um, and exchanging ideas and the Florida Sheriff's Association and the ACLU, Southern Poverty Law Center, academia and more, it's really exciting. So I thank you, thank you so much. Yes. Judge Williams. Judge Williams. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.